One of the fundamentals uh, about the adaptive universe is that we're always operating in a trade space, and that trade space has multiple trade-off dimensions. Now, while handling trade-offs is commonplace in various algorithms, mathematics, and engineering practices, and systems engineering, how we draw trade-offs and how we really deal with them often can get quite difficult to understand, and we, have, we struggle to represent and navigate trade-offs. So we have to go off and draw a basic picture of a trade-off. So to draw a picture of a trade-off, we have, are, are only able to do one at a time, and that's a problem, right? So one trade-off, has, each trade-off has two dimensions, and it's easy to draw one. Well, it's actually not easy. It's hard for people to understand. And there's different ways we draw it. No one has settled on a single way to draw it across all the different disciplines and ways that we use it. Often it gets hidden in the math, or the drawings are only captured in a, a part of the way we try to work out the mathematics of how to balance trade-offs. So let's just go to the basics. I am going to draw it in a certain way, and the reason I'm drawing it this way is because John Doyle in his talks happened to draw it this way. So I started drawing it this way too. When I was in grad school, we drew it a different way. You can draw it a different way too. But we're gonna go through it one way to draw it. So a trade-off, right, we have two dimensions. We're gonna say high here, low here, high here, low here. So we've got a Y and we've got an X. Now, what's going on when it makes it a trade-off? Makes it a trade-off says that the best I can do, right, the best I can do is a curve something like this. That means this area here is impossible. I can't get there because the trade-off as I try to get higher on one dimension, I must get lower on the other dimension. That's what it means in the trade-off. So trying to balance these, and in some sense, what do we normally do? We normally look for a one sweet spot. Now, how do we do that? If we're just dealing with one trade-off dimension, we need some outside information. We need some values. We need some costs. Right? We don't want certain things to happen more than we do want other things to happen. Some things that happen are more valuable or more costly than other things. And so being at this position is not necessarily the best operating point on these systems. Now, that's not the way it really works, though. The way it really works is we build a system and deploy it into the world, and it changes. It gets older, it gets updated, it gets maintained, and whatever. So actually, we're operating away from that theoretical or hard limit. This is the hard limit line, the best we could possibly do. Often that's idealized. We're actually operating on a different curve given the design, the system, and where it is in its life cycle. Right? So there's a gap between what we've got and what's the best we could do. So what we would really like is a system that could move, so its operating point is relative to this curve. And what we really would like is a ability to move its operating point so that when context changes, costs and benefits change, we would like to operate in a different place biological systems often have this cap capacity to be dynamic in on uh, trade-off dimensions. Think of your attentional system. You can have a concentration priority because you're studying for finals or critical exams. And so you want to block out distracting influences and concentrate on a single task, on a single priority. The attentional system, though, can quite naturally shift into a different mode where the prioritization is on recognizing and adapting to new signals. So if you're walking through campus 
on a nice day at class change time where people are on bikes and scooters and lots of people and throwing frisbees, you're traversing the space ready to react to uh, another person who might collide with you. And so your attentional system has switched dynamically given the context from a concentration priority to a sensitivity to reorient to, to new intruders or new threats in your environment as you move through the environment. Now, but what we would also like is not just to move on a trade-off curve, right? We also would like to move closer to this. Right? Can we get here and can we in getting here, still have flexibility to adjust our position in the space. Now, we're also going to talk about this in the context of right, our units, our adaptive units exist in a network. So we can talk about how does a region, an area of the network, composed of multiple units, so we think of that region as now a larger order adaptive unit. How does this adaptive unit made up of other adaptive units how does the higher order adaptive unit perform better relative to the multiple trade dimensions that govern its performance, right? Relative to where the subsystems, the subunits that it's made up of, how they are positioned. So this would be an example where you might have some subunits which are fast. I want to be fast, but to be fast, I end up being less accurate. And I might have others where I emphasize accuracy, but to get more accuracy, whatever the curve shape is that they're operating on, I have to get slower. Also, I may have to build systems physically differently so that they are more accurate, right? And I may have to build them in a, a completely different way in order to get them to respond quickly. Now, we can have new technology which shifts the curve. It shifts the balance, right? But there's still always that to get faster, I may have an impact on accuracy. Now that we've introduced a, a few basics about drawing a trade-off, and even though we're stuck in just showing one dimension, let's talk about two of the trade-offs. There are more, at least five. Uh, two of the trade-offs that arose at the beginning of resilience engineering and the pursuit of the underlying science we've talked about. So the first one is kind of what was brought up under robust yet fragile, or what we were discovering empirically as a pattern and a lawful generalization about the risk of brittleness right, and how that was, was a threat to safety of complex systems. So empirical and formal lines of inquiry identify a fundamental trade-off. Right? And that is the y-axis then would be robust optimality. We are pursuing optimality and we are building in conditions by which that pursuit is also robust to certain factors that would threaten the, that system, that algorithm, whatever. So what disruptions, perturbations, uh, excess variability, what would happen that would make it hard for that for us to pursue optimality? So we need to have some good defense against those threats. But those are ones that we well understand. We've modeled them, we've analyzed them. So we are pursuing optimality and adding in robustness constraints. But remember, there are fundamental limits on how well we can pursue robustness. So in this case, we are looking at on the x-axis, you can think of this as extensibility or brittleness. So that which one you put in the foreground flips where it's high and low. So high extensibility uh, is what we would like to have, not high brittleness. So that we end up with this trade-off between pursuing optimality means that we will get more brittle. If we pursue extensibility, it takes resources, and those resources will appear to be inefficient or unproductive relative to the criterion we pursue over here. 
So if we just see this as a single dimension, right, our underlying problem is improving extensibility to offset brittleness appears to degrade optimality because robustness can't be complete. And so that leaves us in a trap. So resilience engineering is about what are the ways that we can shift the kinds of curves and shift the way or, uh, the system, the network, behaves in a way to move it closer to the hard limit on this trade-off and to increase its ability to switch its position under different conditions and contexts. So under when the world is highly stable, right, it's easier to do robustness. It's more likely to be practically more complete. It's going to be more stable. It's going to give you clear indication that things are starting to change. On the other hand, when the world is uncertain, when volatility is high, right, that says we should we should pr put more of an emphasis on extensibility relative to optimality. Now, resilience engineering says, I want to escape simply moving back and forth. I want to dynamically shift, right? So this is why the value of future adaptive capacity goes up when the signals are coming in that the future is changing. The future is going to be more turbulent. The future is going to have more stressors and that is what is happening in our world. And that is always a potential to happen that we need to have an architecture that allows us, even in times of stability, to be ready to respond, to be ready to revise. Now, there is a, a second trade-off that emerged as resilience engineering took off. It was first mentioned in 2001 by my colleague, Eric Hallnagel, and that's the efficiency thoroughness trade-off. In order to get more efficient, uh, I, um, I may, or speed, I may end up having to reduce thoroughness. And so we talk about this as ETTO, E-T-T-O, efficiency thoroughness trade-off. So that's a second trade-off dimension. So now we have two trade-off dimensions. And they interact being fast may be important in some situations, but if I degrade thoroughness too much, that can create risk of failure and breakdown. So how do I end up becoming insufficiently thorough relative to the pressure for speed? So we're gonna look at real cases. Where does this play out? Uh, disaster response, large scale extreme weather events, hurricanes. How about Hurricane Sandy that hit New York? So we were able to look at an actual organization, how it adapts to potential for critical events that threaten its performance in the short run and its viability in the long run, and how they adjusted their efficiency thoroughness or speed thoroughness for the preparation and response to the hurricane event. They do this by sacrificing on other dimensions by reconfiguring and reprioritizing across multiple trade-off dimensions. So it becomes a case of what does it mean to reprioritize and reconfigure? We can do the same thing with the emergency room in a mass casualty event. How does it reconfigure and reprioritize? What are the other dimensions along of uh, trade-off dimensions where sacrifices occur in order to rebalance, move closer to the hard limit on one or another trade-off while moving further away, sacrificing performance on another trade-off dimension? Because remember, in the cases we're dealing with, we're going to be looking at three of these interacting or more. Our best guess right now is it's five-dimensional. 